Hello, I'm Jay Beckley from Stone Creek Bible Church in Temecula, California. And I'm so glad that you came to join us this morning and that you're spending this time in the Word of God with us, uh, preparing your heart for the Christmas season. This morning we're going to be in Luke chapter 23. And I want to just uh, read a few verses for us to begin our time together. Verse 23, verse 1. <clears throat> oh no, I'm sorry, 23, verse 28. After Jesus' crucifixion and his sentencing, they led him away. And they seized one Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, and laid on him the cross to carry it behind Jesus. And there followed him a great multitude of the people, and of women who were mourning and lamenting for Jesus. Now, this is a pretty brief introduction to the passage for this morning. As Jesus is headed for the cross, they seize this guy named Simon of Cyrene. And Cyrene was a, a city on the, on the northern uh, coast of Africa, on the Mediterranean Sea, the other side of Egypt, in an area we now call Libya. And so Simon had probably come to Jerusalem for Passover. Imagine he was prosperous, he was intelligent, he was mature. He comes to Jerusalem, maybe with some family members or some friends. He's going to celebrate this great feast of Passover, which celebrates God's deliverance and, and freedom for the Jews because of the Passover experience. And he's coming from the country into Jerusalem, probably to get the Passover lamb to take home to eat with his family. And so he's standing there coming up the street and there's this parade coming down the street with some Roman soldiers and he stands off to the side and then one of the soldiers grabs him and says, hey you, <laughs> come here, <laughs> you're going to carry the cross. And so he carries the cross down the road behind Jesus. Imagine what this guy went through. <laughs> he went from having one of the best days of his life to having one of the worst days of his life. He's carrying the cross behind this convicted person. And... Uh, then you discover that this turns into probably one of the best days of his life. Talk about a zoo, you know, from a great day to, a, to the worst day to the best day. Why? Because God reaches him out of the, he grabs him out of the crowd and allows him to see firsthand what Jesus goes through. He carries that cross all the way to Calvary, and I'm sure that he must have stood there and watched the events now that his day was messed up. And then he got to see what Jesus went through. He got to hear Jesus' words. He got to see how people treated Jesus. Now, I'm not going to go into a long study, but Simon of Cyrene is also mentioned in Mark. And Mark, which is a gospel to the Romans, basically, written under the direction of Peter. It may have been written in Rome. And he mentions these two guys who were probably leaders in the church, in the early church. When he describes Simon of Cyrene, he calls, he says, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus. <laughs> and so we don't have any idea really what's going on in Simon's life, but he's the father of two guys that become leaders in the early church. And then later on in Romans, Paul talks about Rufus. He's he sends greetings to Rufus at the church in Rome when he writes his letter to Rome called Romans. Now, he hasn't been to Rome yet. He's writing this letter to the Romans, and he says, Greet Rufus, because his mother was like a mother to me. <laughs> so we discover in these little few verses, if you do the detective thing, that Simon of Cyrene had a son named Rufus who became a leader in the church, and whose mother, Simon's wife, probably Simon's widow, takes Paul under her wing during part of his ministry. Maybe at Antioch when he starts preaching the gospel and is chosen as a missionary. Maybe at Antioch in Pisidia where he, where he um, goes on his first missionary journey. Or, you know, maybe in Rome. We don't know. But we are given this very interesting indication that something happened in Simon of Cyrene's life the day he carried Jesus' cross. He got to see and hear the events of Jesus' crucifixion, and it had an impact not only on him, but on his sons. 
and on his wife. And that that impact carried into the New Testament and had an impact on the life of the Apostle Paul. What an amazing thing. The guy's worst day, <laughs> here, carry this cross, turns into one of his best days. A life-transforming experience that has a continuing legacy as we read through the New Testament. What an amazing thing to have this experience. And Luke's the only one who tells us the details of some of the things that follow this. And so I'm kind of excited. Now, then after Simon, verse 27, there followed him a great multitude of the people and of the women who were mourning and lamenting for him. I don't know what that means, but there must have been a crowd of women. We know there was a crowd of women from Galilee who had come down to see the, the Passover with Jesus that particular year. We know that there were people in Jerusalem who loved Jesus and believed in him and who had listened to him preach at the temple just days before this. And when he was being led out to be crucified, some of these women were brave enough to go along with the parade and wail and grieve. And I think that in Middle Eastern terms, when they experience the loss of a loved one, there is a public grieving that takes place. And uh, that grieving is a part of the tradition of, of, of moaning the loss that you're going to experience. And so these women were following Jesus in this parade and they were wailing and moaning just as a way of expressing the emotional disappointment that they experienced. Oh my goodness. And then Jesus turns to them and says something very unusual. Verse 20, 28. But turning for, to them, Jesus said, and we don't read this in Mark, we don't read this in John, we don't read this in Matthew. Jesus says, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For they do these things when the wood is green. What will happen when it is dry? What a strange thing to say to the women who are wailing, following you down this path on the way to your crucifixion. Oh my goodness. I've thought a lot about this passage this week. And we know that raising families is one of the best things. <laughs> and it can be one of the worst things. And we know that wanting a family can be one of the best things. And it can be one of the worst things. And so this morning, one of the things that comes out to me in this passage is that Jesus is also raising issues that challenge and make us question, is this a good day or is this a bad day? And how, is, how am I going to look at this? And what am I going to reflect about this? Then he uses these, these terms where he says, where they will begin to say to the mountains, fall on us and to the hills, cover us. And that's a quote from Hosea chapter 8. And people that knew the scripture would have heard him say that and they would have gone back to Hosea and they would have read this passage about God's judgment on wicked men and women and how during the the captivity when the Assyrian army came in and attacked Samaria the men and women ran up to the hills and hid in the caves and prayed for the for an earthquake that the that the stones would come down and cover up the entrance to the cave and protect them from these guys that were tearing their homes and families apart and so Jesus was reminding the people of Jerusalem when they reject God, which is what they were doing at his crucifixion, there is a coming judgment, and it will be severe. And he, again, is using this uh, trip down the Via Dolorosa to prophecy and to remind and to warn the women who were following this procession that there was a judgment to come that they needed to be prepared for, that they needed to prepare their families for. And he is not, he has not, given up his ministry as a prophet. And so we see him in this passage, you know, as a prophet. Then this comment about, they do these things when the wood is green, what will happen when it is dry? Well, if you turn to Ezekiel 20, 47, you'll see that this is a quote from Ezekiel, a chapter on God's judgment. And how when God pours his wrath out, there are people that are productive, they are the green trees, they are, they are producing good things, and there are the dry trees that aren't producing anything. They're just ready to go in the fireplace. And what he's saying here is that there is a point in God's judgment when both the green trees and the dry trees get burned up. And as you read that passage in Ezekiel, it, it's, it's almost scary. It's like, oh my goodness, 
there is a there is a time of judgment when nobody gets spared <laughs> absolutely but it also opens up one of the themes that i want you to think about today we are tempted to think that bad people go to a bad place and good people go to a good place and one of the things that we're learning in this passage today is that that is not true. <laughs> that is not true. As a matter of fact, one of the most dangerous situations you can be in is thinking that you're one of the good guys. Because in this passage, we discover that the chief priests and the Pharisees, they were the ones crying, crucify him, crucify him. The good guys were actually doing the wrong thing. And the bad guys <laughs> were obviously doing the wrong thing. They were taking care of Jesus. They were, they were ridiculing him. They were beating him. They were leading him out. They were nailing him to a cross. Oh my goodness, what in the world is going on? It seems like the good guys and the bad guys are against Jesus. Well, I love this, uh, this problem in this passage. Because it forces us to ask, what kind of a person do I want to be? Now, there's a very interesting uh, story as we go through the book of Luke. One of the things that we discovered was that there are a handful of people that Jesus looks at in the gospel of Luke and actually says, hey, dude, your sins are forgiven. <laughs> hey, young woman, <laughs> you are saved. And in Luke 7, 20, there's this story of Jesus going to a banquet that was held by the good guys, a Pharisee. A godly, socially acceptable guy who thought he understood what God expected and that he was doing what God wanted him to do. Jesus comes and sits down in his home. And uh, in Luke 7, 20, we read that uh, this woman comes in. And the good guy looks at the woman and, and she is kneeling at Jesus' feet and crying and literally washing her feet with her, his feet with her tears. And then drying his feet with her hair. <laughs> And this Pharisee is a little bit irritated. You can tell by the way he says, you know, I don't know. If this guy was a prophet, he would know what kind of a woman this is, and, and he wouldn't let her touch him. <laughs> oh my goodness, what does that mean? Well, that means that this Pharisee knew this girl's reputation. He knew that she wasn't somebody that he wanted in, in his house, taking care of his guest. And the fact that she was there ministering to Jesus made him question who Jesus really was. But in the dialogue, as you finish that little story, Jesus looks at this girl and he says to her, your sins are forgiven. Then he looks at, at, the, at the Pharisee and he says, hey, you didn't wash my feet. She's washed my feet. You didn't anoint me. She's anointed me. You didn't pay attention to me. She has worshiped me. And then he looks at this girl and says, your sins are forgiven. You are going to be saved. And I was shocked when I read that in Luke 7 as we go through that, that gospel because there's not very many people in the Bible in the New Testament that Jesus points his finger at and says, oh, you're saved. And it was this girl <laughs> who had a, 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 a dark past, who had all kinds of problems in her life, uh, who had been probably uh, taken as a victim for <laughs> more times than she wanted to remember. And Jesus is telling her, hey, <laughs> your sins are forgiven and you're saved. Oh my goodness. And as we read through Luke, we've seen several of these stories. We've seen a centurion uh, come and ask Jesus to heal his, his uh, daughter. And, that, and Jesus says, this guy has more faith than anybody in Israel that I've ever seen. Oh my goodness. And there's these two guys Jesus talks about who goes to pray at the temple. A Pharisee. Dear God, thank you for making me a wonderful person. You know, and then a tax collector who beat his chest. And said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus says, that tax collector went home righteous. That tax collector is going to heaven. And now in this passage, on the day of Jesus' crucifixion, we are introduced to these characters who don't seem like they fit into the story of God's, God's working in the world. And yet, and yet Luke tells us that these people are a part of the story. <laughs> Simon the Cyrene. I think it's interesting that his name was Simon. <laughs> not Mark or Matthew or John or something else, but Simon. Why is this guy's name Simon? You know, the day before, Peter was saying, I'll go to prison, I'll die for you. And then before the roosters crow, Peter denies that he even knows Jesus. <laughs> and
And Peter's, Peter's birth name was Simon. That's why they called him Simon Peter. It's almost like this guy is the replacement for Peter in the story. This guy is the guy who's doing what Peter should have been doing. You know, I'll carry the cross. I will help him. I will stand in his place. I will be identified with him and I will support him in what he's doing. Oh my goodness. The second Simon in the story of Jesus' crucifixion. And then for him to leave a legacy in his son's life and in his wife's life, a, a legacy of leadership in the church, a legacy in, of faith in God. Oh my goodness, what an amazing story. And then these women who follow Jesus, wailing. And Jesus tells them, you know, guides them in their emotional process. Hey, you need to think about yourselves. You need to think about your children. And then we come to the end of this passage. And Jesus says, Verse 32, two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, or Golgotha in some translations, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Now, I'm amazed that as Luke tells this story, <laughs> we see something, we're, we're given a detail. We're told which cross Jesus was crucified on. <laughs> like, isn't, I just think that's weird. We know Jesus was crucified on the middle cross. <laughs> and on his right and on his left, there were two criminals. Almost like there were two people that shared this experience with Jesus. And then Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Well, what was he talking about? Well, I think Jesus was talking about the soldiers. The soldiers that were just doing their job crucifying three criminals who had been condemned to death. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now in Acts chapter 8, when Peter preaches the sermon at, at Pentecost, he talks about this. And he says that Jesus forgave the leaders in Jerusalem who condemned him to death, the soldiers who nailed him to the cross, the people who stood by and cheered, crucify him, crucify him. There was a whole lot of people in this story that weren't on the right side. They weren't on Jesus' side. They were on their own side. And they were just doing what they thought was right, what they thought their job was, what they thought people wanted them to do. And those are dangerous, dangerous positions to be in. <laughs> and I encourage you, we need to do what God wants us to do. Not what our friends think is right, not what our boss thinks is right, not what our community thinks is right, but we need to do what God tells us to do. We need to have a perspective that is God's perspective. And so Jesus, and Luke goes on telling this uh, story. But before we read any more, I want to just help you see that in this passage, Luke reveals Jesus in his three-part ministry. The first part of this story is Jesus being the prophet, telling the women, hey, <laughs> there is coming a judgment, and Jerusalem's going to get torn down. And if you're still here, you and your children are going to suffer because of God's judgment as a result of what happens today. So today is going to seal your future. He's a prophet. He's a priest because he prays to God for the people that were nailing him to the cross, saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And Peter, in his sermon at Pentecost, he separates this idea of being bad, from the idea of being ignorant. Now, there were some people there that knew exactly who Jesus was, and they were, they were putting him to death because they wanted power. They wanted prosperity. They wanted pleasure. And they were willing to do anything to get the things that they wanted. They knew who, exactly who Jesus was, and they rejected him anyway. And so Luke gives us this little, little bit of a clue in the difference between those who are boldly sinning rejecting the truth that they understand to be true and choosing to ignore God's, God's work in their life. And then there's people who do bad things who are just ignorant. They don't know what they're doing. They do not understand the implications, and Jesus prays for them. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And I think all of us can sense in our own lives times when we make decisions to do things that are wrong, and we know what we're doing is wrong. And there are times when we do wrong and, and we have no clue what the implications of that are. And we find out in the days and weeks that follow how bad that decision we made actually was. Oh my goodness. So Jesus is prophet, priest, and king. 
the three titles or the three roles that Jesus plays in the Bible from the Old Testament to the New Testament are prophet, priest, and king. And Luke actually describes Jesus in those roles on the day of his crucifixion. He's prophet, he's priest, praying for the people's forgiveness that don't understand what they do. And then he moves into this last passage, which is all about his identity as the king. The, the end of that Christmas passage in Isaiah 9, where it says that he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Almighty God, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And so we can, we can look at this last section uh, from a, with a little bit different perspective. Verse 32, two others were criminals. They were led away to be put to death with Jesus. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments, and the people stood by watching. But the rulers scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself. If he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. And the soldiers mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine, and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him that said, this is the king of the Jews. I love that Luke takes this perspective in his story when you put it together. That the chief priests bring Jesus to Pilate and say, crucify him, crucify him, because he claims to be the Messiah, a king. And then Pilate asks him, are you king of the Jews? And Jesus said, well, it is as you say. <laughs> And then the, the accusation, the indictment that Pilate writes for Jesus is, this man is king of the Jews. When the Romans would lead someone out to be crucified, the indictment or the charges would be printed on a placard that he would carry around his neck. And some of the Roman historians described this process. And then we, they would get to the place of crucifixion, that placard, the charges would be posted on the cross above them so that everybody would understand, if you do these things, this is what happens to you. <laughs> execution or execution by, by uh, crucifixion was an was a incredible public humiliation. And it was only allowed to be used on slaves and foreigners. If you're a Roman citizen, they could not crucify you because it was thought to be too cruel, too humiliating. And yet that's how Jesus died. He died with this the charges this is the king of the Jews. I love that. It's if God is, has this thing of irony. Like, really? The, the thing that Jesus is crucified for is exactly who he is, exactly who he was designed to be. They actually crucified him for being the king of the Jews, and that's exactly who he is? How strange is that? How weird is that? Well, as we close this passage, we discover that in verse 30, we hear this little story. One of the criminals who were hanged rallied at him or railed at him. And railing is uh, just yelling accusations that may be found unfounded or may be founded. And he was saying, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, do you not fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, truly, I say unto you, today you will be with me in paradise. What an amazing thing where these two criminals. Now, this chapter is almost like a word picture of what the New Testament in the Gospel of Luke tells us. The first story, Simon of Cyrene, is the one who picks up Jesus' cross and follows him all the way to his crucifixion. You know, in the times in Luke when Jesus would tell to his disciples, just pick up your cross and follow me. <laughs> There's something about picking up your cross and following Jesus. It's a decision. It's a decision that embraces whatever God has for us. Suffering, humiliation, all the different things that are part of that crucifixion experience are part of that decision that Christians make to pick up their cross and follow Jesus. Hey, I'll do anything. I'll go anywhere God wants me to go because I'm following Jesus. I'm not following my, my 
social media screen or my, my friend group friend. I'm not following my community. I'm not following even my country in terms of what it tells me to do. I'm following Jesus. And so we take up our cross not to do good, <laughs> not to be famous, not to be powerful, not to be political. We take up our cross to follow Jesus and do what Jesus wants us to do. And so in this story, we have this amazing thing where we are literally shown in, by, in the Gospel of Luke how to pick up your cross and follow Jesus and what that means. And then we're also given at the end of this little story, these two guys hanging on the, the side of Jesus and, and one rails against him. Here's a guy who's being crucified for capital crimes. He's a thief. He's a con man. He's a crook. He may be a murderer. He may be a rapist. We don't know, but he was deserving of death. <laughs> Nailed to a cross with Jesus, looking over saying, hey, <laughs> you know, basically, you're on the cross. You're no better than I am. And I can criticize you as much as I want to. The guy on the other side makes a different choice. He makes a choice to recognize who Jesus is. And he says, Jesus, when you come into your kingdom, because I believe you're a king, that statement tells us that something had happened in the heart of that guy hanging on a cross when he saw Jesus crucified and how he responded to those soldiers and how he responded to the spectators and how he responded to the disciples that were hiding in the crowd and how he responded to the soldiers who were nailing him to the cross. That criminal said, no, this guy is innocent and he is the king that I've heard them talk about. He is going to make a difference. And he says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Oh my goodness. And Jesus says one of the most shocking, one of the most amazing, one of the most powerful things at the at this at this moment before he dies. He looks at that cross that looks over at that guy on the cross next to him and he says, "You will be in, with me in paradise today. <laughs> today you will be in, with me in paradise. I've heard what you've said and that's enough. You're going with me to paradise." Is that amazing? I'm, I just think it's amazing. There's all these people in the Gospel of Luke that Jesus says, yep, you're saved. Yep, your sins are forgiven. Yep, you're going with me to paradise. I'm amazed that Jesus was so direct with some of these people. And when you look at the list of the people, you know, a girl who worked on the streets, a tax collector who stole from people, a criminal who was about to die, and he's pledging his, his faith in Christ. And Jesus is saying, hey, today you'll be with me in paradise. I love that. It's, it's the gospel. There's one thing I want to share with you now as we kind of come to the end of our time in this chapter. And it's almost shocking. But as I read through this chapter, one of the things I've discovered is that people who do evil, wicked things, they are going to suffer the judgment of God. There is a judgment coming. And Jesus warned those women who were wailing about that judgment. There is a judgment for evil, wicked people. But there is also a judgment for people who think they're good enough. And as you read through the New Testament, I can prove to you over and over again that this is true. Good people are going to hell. Bad people are going to hell. Satisfying God's expectations is not about being good or being bad. Satisfying God's expectations is about realizing that we are all sinners. Not one of us deserve to be in the presence of God for all of eternity. The only way we get there is by confessing our sins and admitting how guilty we are and then, and then inviting Jesus to be our Savior. Asking Jesus to forgive our sins putting our faith and trust in God's plan for our lives. And then, just like Jesus said for this thief on the cross, this day thou shalt be with me in paradise. Oh my goodness. There was no sacraments. There was no <laughs> communion for this guy on the cross. There was no baptism. There was nothing except faith in Jesus Christ. And Jesus affirms that with this promise. Today you will be with me in paradise. I love that. I just love that because it makes the gospel so basic that everybody can be part of it. Nobody needs to be left out. Yeah, you're a good person. You've lived your life. You've done some good things, but you also are very aware of the mistakes you've made and the things that you have done that don't honor God. <laughs> Is there a place for you? 
at the foot of the cross? Absolutely. Absolutely. You're a person who grew up in a tough family. You've made terrible decisions. You've done things that most people would consider to be evil and cruel and wicked. Is there a place for you at the foot of the cross? Absolutely. Just like this thief dying on the cross next to Jesus. Lord, remember me when you get into your kingdom. This day thou shalt be with me in paradise. You see, the gospel isn't about bad people being judged or good people being rewarded. The gospel is about people who are willing to admit the truth. I am a sinner. Lord, come into my life, forgive my sin, and teach me how to live obediently when I read your word. And as you direct my life, teach me how to follow you in this process. And so I love this, the way Luke gives us this, this, this journey to the cross, so to speak. He's filled it with stories of people who come to know Jesus as their Savior, and he has a huge impact on their life. So even in the worst day of your life, there's hope. Even in the worst day of your life, there's a possibility for something that can change your life, something that can be meaningful in your life. No matter what our challenges and struggles are, the solution to those challenges and struggles is to trust the Lord and allow him to guide and direct our lives every single day, even on the worst days of our life. God can do things in our life that will change all of eternity.